Preserving and protecting the diabetic foot has been described as a mechanical challenge. A problem of mechanics as much as medicine. In this presentation we touch upon why this is so. I'm going to point out some of the complexity behind terms such as friction, pressure and shear stress and the implications for footwear design. We conclude by listing some of the principles to keep in mind when designing shoes for the diabetic foot. We know that ill-fitting or inappropriate footwear are major contributors to ulcer development and we know that it is vital to try to identify and protect the feet of those who are, as yet, at low risk of ulceration. Prevention of ulceration should be so simple and yet in practice is complex. There was an interesting study recently showing that a large percentage of persons presenting for an initial diabetic foot assessment had incorrectly sized shoes. This points to the need for much earlier intervention and better patient education and awareness on this topic. There's certainly a lot of confusion on the topic of shoes for persons with diabetic foot disease. We seem to have a general lack of clarity about exactly how shoes for diabetic patients should be designed, manufactured and prescribed. There's certainly confusion, even an abuse of terminology. In the minds of many, there's a belief that prescription shoes can't be all that complicated. However, this is a mistaken belief. As in many aspects of biomechanics, the subject is much more complex than we might like. Now I'd better start with a confession. Everything I will tell you is a lie, but hopefully a useful lie. The reason for this comes down to how biomechanics, that is, engineering applied to gain an understanding of body systems, must rely on models of reality. You see, these models are never perfect. They're simplifications that we can hold to be true for a while or in particular uh, situations. The fact is, sooner or later, a better model and improved understanding comes along. So when we use terms like force, pressure, stress, strain, we should do so acknowledging the inherent limitations of our viewpoint. For thousands of years humans have sought to understand nature. For example, Plato recognized that mathematics and the disciplines of deductive and mathematical reasoning could act as the life force of science, driving mankind on to greater and greater discoveries. Indeed, science has successfully used a mechanical perspective to gain improved understanding of nature. However, the emergence of bioengineering and biomechanics has limitations. What bioengineers understand, and often others forget, is that these mechanical perspectives are inevitably imperfect and limited they represent, after all, tools for thinking and are not the truth as such. These subjects, the diabetic foot included, have many hidden complexities. With the diabetic foot, we understand that each affected individual may well have neuropathy, tissues of the foot that have mechanical characteristics differing from normal. They may have altered anatomical structures. These mechanical characteristics will vary from person to person and are modified by the disease process. They will even vary in one per person over time. As we move through our environment, the interaction 
or uh, in other words the points of contact we have with our environment have mechanical and therefore biological consequences. The forces generated for example manifest as changing patterns of pressure, friction and shear force. These occur at the foot shoe interface and deep within the tissues of the foot. Most of us believe we have a good grasp of the physical meaning of pressure. After all, it's simple to imagine how pressure is created through the application of load over an area. But it is difficult to accurately measure. And it's not just a surface effect when we apply load to tissue. You see the skin, muscle and soft tissues deform and experience these mechanical loads in different ways. Many of the strategies that are applied in the creation of footbeds and footwear aim to spread applied loads over a greater area, thereby reducing the local pressure gradients. Now two of the terms we frequently hear are friction and shear. Actually, strictly speaking, there are a number of different types of friction and shear. Friction is the force that resists the relative motion of solid surfaces in contact. It is in practical terms very difficult to calculate a value for friction. It generally has to be determined empirically. Friction and shear stress occur together and this is why we try to minimize them in footwear for diabetics. Shear stress results when a force acts coplanar to a surface with a result that the tissues deform. And when the tissues deform and flex to extremes we have part of the precursor necessary for ulceration. Well, at a simpler level, what do we know for sure? We do know that high pressure is bad and that friction and shear are potentially very bad. We also know that localized pressure, creating pressure gradients and localized tissue deformation creates damaging shear stresses. But that level of knowledge in itself isn't sufficient to help us with the ideal shoe design. In order to influence design we need to delve deeper and this is where biomechanics can be useful. If we take a look at tissue closely we see that it, it isn't homogeneous. There are actually multiple layers skin, fat, muscle, bone and other structures each with different behaviors under load. And of course the foot and ankle is a dynamic jointed structure that is meant to be rigid at some phases of gait and flexible at others. Engineers have studied areas of the foot such as the heel pad to understand how such tissue behaves under dynamic loading conditions so as, such as those experienced during gait. However, as we try to model this type of situation and truly discover the way that um, a foot interacts with a shoe, we really discover its inherent complexity. Notice that the dynamic behavior of the tissue might well be modeled using forms well understood by engineers. When we have to make choices about shoe design, we have to be mindful of the need for both foot protection and control. Just as we saw with tissue, we potentially have multiple layers that have individual mechanical characteristics and shapes with the potential to harm or protect. During walking and other activities, the shoe will flex and twist and thought must be given to how the shoe and tissues will interact. By all means, have materials that behave like tissue in contact with the plantar surface and high load-bearing areas of the foot. 
but we need to be mindful about how the whole shoe and footbed work together. For example, if the thickness and weight of the upper is not matched to the flexibility of the sole unit, the shoe is likely to distort under the loads generated during walking, and the result almost certainly will be undesirable levels of pressure, friction and shear. Using a mixture of measurement and mathematics, we can predict, for example, how different interface materials will influence the surface pressures and shear stresses. These approaches are always simplifications because we have to make assumptions about the conditions that prevail. Of course, we wish to manage the performance of the interface between foot and shoe, knowing that in use, the parameters that we need to fine-tune that performance will vary from situation to situation and from person to person. Let me give you um, a metaphor to consider. In motorsport, good performance actually needs great suspension. In racing a motorcycle, we have a complex, dynamic environment. We have an interface where the rubber meets the road, and the forces generated have to be managed from instant to instant. In order to make rapid progress and control the dynamic forces that exist, the mechanical suspension needs to be optimized. We would need to find just the correct elasticity and damping for the suspension system. Otherwise, we literally crash and burn. The mathematics actually of tuning the suspension are not so different from that required to tune the interface between foot and shoe. Here's a list, a short list actually, of principles that should guide us. First of all, we need accurate, reliable measurements of the foot. At present, we have a plethora of techniques and beliefs about how measurements should be done. Clearly, if measurements cannot be taken consistently and reliably, we are off to a bad start. Some areas of the foot are particularly sensitive to localized pressure gradients and therefore prone to ulceration if we get our basic measurements wrong. The insole and components of the shoe should be designed to work together. It's not good enough to put a soft tissue-like insole into a shoe and hope for the best. Materials to chosen to behave like tissue should certainly go close to tissue but if we are to minimize stress these insole materials need to interface with the structure of the shoe. Take a look at the human body that has layers of tissue for good reason. The skeleton, ligaments and tendons transmit force while the soft tissues absorb dynamic stresses and strains. The shoes we design should act like the skeleton too, not just like the soft tissues. They should allow safe transmission of dynamic load and should allow control and protection to be imposed. To think that shoes should always have soft roomy uppers, for example, is very inaccurate and mechanically flawed thinking. Of course, we should choose the materials carefully and position them within a shoe so that they have the desired effect of control or tissue matching. Well, I hope I've confused you. Confusion actually is a very good thing. It ensures that you and I question our collective understanding of this simple topic. Shoes suitable for the diabetic foot. It should help you question some beliefs and ideas that at best don't serve us and at worst deceive us into prolonging the solution.